So hello everybody. Um, so we have a talk today about parallelization and optimization, and the idea basically is to um, well to give you like uh, I had like this idea when last time the speaker was basically talking about uh, Python and doing C stuff in Python. Um, that I do a little introduction into how to program in C and how to optimize things in C so that you can write fast code and then maybe you can call it from Python or whatever. But uh, the story is also that I have the feeling that today basically the new students, they are kind of uh, reticent to do all these things and that these things are not as hard as they, as they are actually, as they seem to be. And that's why basically why I give this talk so that you have a, a small introduction on, on, on what, what programming in C is like and, and, and what it looks like. Yeah, and so that's kind of the stuff. Um, so the question is why optimization? So um, I agree with you that many people basically say, okay, there are people who spend all their life on doing optimization and finally they don't write programs. Um, so that's one side of the story, but there's also the other side of the story that you actually, you should do this. Yeah. Um, because, uh, well, first of all, um, th this is several times this happened to me that you actually, uh, teams is doing stuff. Um, uh, that basically you, you can write programs that, that bring your things into reach that basically before, before they're out of reach. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you can treat more data, you can have a bigger experiment, you can have new, um, you, you, you can obtain new results. Yeah? So this is basically one thing that, that really happens. Um, then clever optimization can really yield several magnitudes of better performance. And uh, uh, it really, I mean, it's happened to me that basically with the things that I'm showing here you that you arrive at doing, doing 1000 times the performance that you might have had before in let's say, in a single core Python code, yeah? Um, that's, that's the way it is. So uh, a, a second thing basically that you have is basically green computing and carbon emissions. So uh, at one day it really will, will fall on our head what we're like doing here. So uh, there are people that saying that software gets faster, slower than our computers get faster. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you have this feeling, but that's, that's kind of, uh, the way it is, so basically it's you buy a new computer, it seems to run faster and three months later basically it's slow again because the software has deteriorated uh, in, in that time that much. Yeah. Um, so data centers around the world, they seem to consume right now uh, around 200 terawatt hours globally, so this is was the, the number estimated by the EAA, so this is basically the International Energy Organization. Uh, in 2018, so if you compare it, so this is basically half the electricity consumption of France, uh, so a rough estimate, yeah, if you want to, yeah. Um, and so, uh, well, of course, the faster your code runs, the less energy it consumes. Um, th this is a basic, a basic thing behind it. And the stuff is like, I wouldn't say all this because uh, it's, it's fun, but the stuff is like basically that uh, at a certain point, we need to, to change our paradigm, yeah? because right now it's basically, okay, um, the software developers, I understand they're under stress, they want to finish the projects, they have to write code fast, but uh, at the idea is basically, yeah, I write my code, and anyway, if my code runs slow, it doesn't matter, because a new generation of computers will come up, and in two years, everything will run, and it will be fine. Yeah? Um, so this was, I guess, for the last two decades or three decades, kind of the paradigm that you had there. Yeah? Um, but the stuff is where does this end? Yeah? So, I mean, um, the, the story is like, if right now you go to a website, and so the average website right now, so on whatever website you basically go, uh, on mean, when you type in an URL into your URL bar, you download 2.3 megabytes. Yeah. Um, so. This is basically the size of the video game Doom. So if, if, if you ever played that, if you know what, what it is, yeah, that you download with every row that you type into your address bar. Yeah. Um, that, that's where we are. So if you if you compare this to a book, so if you read this book in, in plain text, uh, basically, which is not that small, I mean, for French literature, yeah. Um, so this is one megabyte in size in text, in plain text. 
So basically, each website that you type in, you you download two times this book. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, I mean, there's a blog about this, which basically talks about this website, the obesity crisis, and how we came there. And uh, I, I let you read this. This is not part of the talk. Uh, but just to, uh, I mean, if I go to Twitter and I just read this tweet, so which is yeah, the size of a tweet, so it's count the words, maybe it's 20 words, I have an idea. Yeah? But just to go to this website, actually, it, it makes a download of 6.8 megabytes. So I download seven times Zola's book yeah, to read 20 words. Yeah, that, That's how efficient we get right now. Yeah, So... Uh, and then people talk, okay, we do green computing and we have, we are more efficient than whatever, it's a little bullshit, yeah? I mean, if I, if I need to download seven times a, a complete book, yeah, which is, I mean, uh, which has 400 or 500 pages, I guess, yeah, to read 20 words, then something's wrong in our world, yeah, uh, to be honest, yeah? Um, and besides that, that uh, loading this page in Firefox right now, uh, so I measured it yesterday, it's like 810 megabytes of RAM. To, to show this website, yeah, um, I, I, yeah, okay, yeah. So and I mean, we did things like this on Minitel, I guess, probably, yeah, uh, which didn't reach a memory in kilobytes, maybe, yeah. So, uh, so, so something's definitely wrong, and so that's where I also say, okay, well, uh, let's think about what we're doing, and maybe let's get back to the basics, yeah. Um, so yeah, so this is also basically, so this was when I had my first computer, basically it had like, um, so uh, uh, this was basically, I had, you have DOS and then you had Windows on that and it took like eight megabytes of hard disk space if you install the whole operating system. So that's like uh, the size that you, that you do when you read two tweets today, yeah? Okay, um, so, so that's where we are. Um, so uh, another story, for example, is like, uh, uh, basically, what we're doing here, so if you do MetaMost here, I mean, not, 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 not really talk about it, but I mean, MetaMost basically takes also, I guess, maybe 800 megabytes of RAM if you load it up in your browser. It takes about five seconds to load, something like this. I mean, if you did the same thing with, with, with IRC chat, so if I launch IRC here on my machine, uh, I just looked it up, so it's a 1.4 megabytes binary, so if I load this in memory, it's also about maybe two megabytes, yeah? Uh, it works perfectly, yeah. It uh, has the same functionality as MetaMost, yeah. But right now, I do the same thing with a gigabyte of RAM. Uh, okay, it has nice graphics, but that's it, yeah. Um, okay, so um, that's why I, I so I think, well, let's go back to this, yeah. Um, and maybe start uh, teaching complexity for simplicity. Uh, and I mean, one of the big problems is basically that uh, engineers are kind of obsessed with complexity. Yeah? So I know all of us, when we are in Python or in C++, we need to write the most complex Lambda function and we think this is the most beautiful thing that we do. Yeah? Then maybe no one understands our code afterwards, but that's, that's software engineering. Yeah, I get this. Yeah? And so um, w one of the problems this has is basically that operating system environment uh, uh, and programming languages are getting more and more complex. Yeah? I mean, uh, if you, uh, when I was starting to program, you just sit down in front of your computer, you fired up your editor, you wrote your code, you compiled it, and most of the time you, you had your things done. Yeah? Today you have Docker containers and I don't know whatever, and you have to, to configure your IDE before that, and, and thousands of stuff, yeah, which basically doesn't even get you start programming. Yeah? Um, and so basically we have a loss of actual functionality and productivity, and basically there's a talk which is called, uh, which goes way further than me, so which basically says we are here at the collapse of civilization. Yeah? Uh, I'm not sure if we're at the collapse of civilization, to be honest, but this guy basically points out that we are today we are incapable basically to exactly know when we draw a pixel on the screen because there's so much API behind it so that, that you basically you can't do it the perfect timing. Yeah? Um, but uh, so, so I, leave, I leave you all this in the slides to, to watch this and so basically this is just the motivation why we do this here. And uh, just to go back to this, so how, how much we lose productivity yeah? is like um, 
So, so this guy is, is, is the creator of Unix, and basically in an interview he said basically well, uh, he was three weeks away from an operating system, so in three weeks basically he, wrote, he used one week to, wrote an, to write an editor, um, so one week to write an assembler, and one week to write a kernel. Yeah? Um, and he did this in three weeks, and I mean the stuff is like it's clear, yeah, today we need three weeks in order to, to just set up the environment in order to get started. Yeah? So that's where basically we lose our creativity. Yeah? So this guy just, he sat in front of the computer, there was an environment, there was just uh, no, no passwords or whatever. So he just got there and went start and started to do his stuff and it worked out. Yeah? Um, and so the question is, well, well, what are we doing in three weeks, yeah? um, to be honest? Yeah? Um, so uh, that's why I say, well, uh, go back to these basics and let's say, well, well embrace the C language. Um, I, so it's really easy to learn. So compared to all the other languages, it doesn't have really weird constructs and whatever. So it's like, it's 240 pages of text there. So it's this basically the, the definition of C. So you can download this on the internet. Yeah, it's very easy to get. Um, it's uh, basically, it's structured programming, so um, you, you don't write assembly code, so you don't really go down to the to the real basics, you really have like a, let's say, I guess this is what makes this language so successful, is that it has like this kind of uh, abstraction optimal, where you, where you still write fast code, and where you still can read the language, let's say like this, yeah? so it's like, this, this is basically what, what, in my opinion, makes it successful. Yeah? Um, if you if you make an effort, you can write the most portable code in it. So if you stick to ANSI 89C, basically, uh, I probably you can compile it from a microcontroller to to I don't know to a high performance computer, and the code will run. Yeah? Um, it also, since most of our uh, operating systems are right now written in C, so basically it gives you full interaction with your operating system. So if you use a higher language, uh, level language, uh, either you have bindings to the operating system's code or you don't. Yeah? Um, and uh, probably, uh, I mean, this is probably only hand handcrafted machine code might be faster. Yeah? Um, so, so that's that's basically the story. I don't want to be an evangelist, yeah, so everybody does what he wants. Yeah? That, but this is just a, a personal opinion. Let's say it like this. Yeah. Um, so, so let's start out. What, what, what we need for this course? Um, how does this whole thing work? Um, so basically, in C, you have data types and you have pointers, and basically, if you have understood this, then you have understood 80% of the language. Yeah? Um, so, so basically, it's a, it's, a, it's a typed language, so basically you have to define the, the, what types your variables are in. Um, so you have, um, this is a typical 64-bit machine in, in Linux, so uh, it depends on your operating system, so the, the sizes might not always be the same. Yeah? So if you're on a 32-bit operating system, I guess the long is also 32-bit or something like this, so it, really, it depends. Yeah? But, uh, on 64-bit on Linux, we have data types like this right now, yeah? Um, and uh, so basically, we have all this stuff, and then we have pointers and function pointers, and we will come to this. So basically, what, what, what does this mean? Um, so basically, you have your memory, and you're in your memory, you basically have addresses, and you have uh, basically, and uh, at this address, basically, you store some value. And of course, you also know, need to know where basically you've stored this value, and basically this is this whole pointer thing. Yeah? So basically you say, okay, I have a pointer um, which provides, which points to an address. So in this case, the address is 13. And then basically I can do something like this. So I can say, okay, from the pointer, take me uh, the first value. So in this case, indexed by zero. Yeah? Um, and then I get out 23. So if I have an offset of two, so I go from here to here, and then I get 45, yeah? And then the other story is like, then well, I can also increment the pointer. So I can say, okay, uh, well, what is the pointer plus three? So then I get to 16, yeah? And if I would put this into brackets and, uh, uh, and then a, a square bracket behind it with a zero, then I would get 72 out of it, yeah? That that's all basically there is that you need to know to understand this this story here, yeah. Um, 
So to make it a bit more 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 more, more usable, so basically it is declares your variable. Um, so on the stack, so basically it declares the variable and it reserves the memory for it. Um, this basically declares a pointer uh, to to such a variable. Uh, uh, this way, basically, you can get the address of this variable and store it in the in this pointer. Um, this is basically the stuff uh, that most people confuse us about C is, um, so uh, it's, you, you basically, you have to manage your own memory, yeah? So it's not like in Python where you just type some stuff and uh, it manages your memory for you, but you have to do it yourself, yeah? So basically if you have, uh, this here basically what you do here is basically you take a pointer and you say basically maybe it just start, start, it starts here and basically it, it allocates uh, you uh, this, so 10 integer values uh, on, on, on what is called the heap. So in memory, you basically you reserve uh, the space for 10 integer values. And you get back a pointer, so you get back the first address here. Yeah? Um, and then basically, if you want to get to write or to read from the third position in this, so you basically you do B3, and then you basically you go, as you have, uh, 10 values you get over here and you get your, your value that you can store there or that you can read there. Um, the problem is the way this works is that you can write P15 in here and there's no checking basically did you reserve this memory or didn't you? Yeah? Uh, okay, um, but we will come back to that. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so that's basically the story. Um, and then you can do things like this. You, you can do arithmetic as you have just shown you with these pointers. So you can say, okay, um, well, P is a pointer and I can create a new pointer, which is P plus C3. And then basically, uh, this, this is basically then true. Yeah. Uh, I guess all this is clear for the audience. How, how far are you? Does everybody know C in here or, 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 or is this? Because if this is boring for you, then we skip this. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so that's basically the story. Then you have these data types, and then you can post, compose these data types into structures. So another stuff is basically you reserve the memory. You can also free the memory. You should basically because otherwise you will consume memory and consume memory, and any day you, and someday you, you won't have any more. Um, and so uh, basically you can you can create these structures and basically put in these types in here, and then you. Uh, have this stuff and then you can make a pointer to such a structure and th this way basically you can you can then get get the values that you have in the structure so if you have a pointer to a structure you can basically dereference it with this stuff here and then you get basically access to to the number that you might have stored in here yeah um, uh, if, if anybody has questions around this do it now because otherwise it will get complex afterwards yeah okay no Everyone's fine? Yeah? Nice. Okay, um, so basically this is, this is basically um, the, the, the whole structure of a program. So basically you, you start with, with, with your main function, which is basically your main entry point. Um, here you basically get how many arguments you give to, this, to, your, to your program. Uh, and here basically you get the arguments. So. Um, so here you have this double pointer structure, so basically it's pointer on, on a pointer, and that you need this because basically a string is basically a pointer to the first character of the string. So the string is basically just indexed like this, and if you have multiple strings, if you have multiple arguments, you have a pointer to, to, to these pointers. Yeah? Um, that's the way it works, and maybe... Um, and then you basically, then you can compile this. Yeah? And how do you do this on a, on a new machine? So basically you have, uh, you can, you, if you just type in GCC like this, so then you get out some unoptimized code. So it just uh, compiles it the way you have written it. Yeah? Um, then we have different optimization levels in GCC. So the, the, most of the compilers basically have cloned this. Uh, so if you use Clang or, 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 um, or ICC, it basically works the same. Um, sorry for that. So um, basically, if you do here O2, uh, uh, so there is like um, up to O2, basically it doesn't do like really wild optimizations. So basically, if you do O2, your code should basically, the result should stay the same. Yeah. 
Um, if you do O3, it might do mass optimizations, which means that uh, the, the result might not be the same. Yeah? So what basically might happen is that um, so if you if in floating point you do A plus B and you do B, B plus A, you get a different result. Yeah? Uh, you get a, and basically in, if you do O3, it doesn't really care about this anymore. Yeah? So that, that's why. Uh, you shouldn't really do this. So basically, then you have this architecture type. So basically, here you can uh, tell it uh, uh, to use the instructions of the processor that you're running on. So you can write here, for example, Core 2. Then you get all the instructions of a Core, a core 2 do a processor or something like this. Um, by default, it uh, uses the most generic 64-bit processor. So even if you do this, you might not get really nice optimized code. Yeah? because uh, you just get generic code that runs on any processor that, that you want to have. Yeah? Um, then uh, basically, if you use this G, you get debug symbols. So basically, you get your C code compiled into the binary so that you can debug it. Yeah? Um, then you can generate assembly code. So if you want to know what the compiler is actually doing, you can say, OK, uh, uh, give, me, give me this DC binary, and let me look at the assembly code. Um, and then basically, uh, yeah, and then you basically you can also see well what does it do if you if you optimize if you ask for these optimizations and look at the differences between those assembly codes to see well what, what the compiler is actually doing, yeah. Um, and then you can use basically GDP in order if you if you compile this this debug symbols in in order to uh, to to uh, to investigate your code while it's running, yeah. Um, and maybe we, we do this quickly um, just to, to show you how this how this looks in, in real life. Um, so let's take this program here and copy paste it into an editor. Wow. Let's do it like this. And if I do hear something like this. Um, and I yank this in here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, seems to work. Okay, that's not very nice, but uh, let's do something like this. Looks better, no? Um, there's something wrong here. So basically, here you have this new program that, that we've just shown you here before. So um, uh, every, do, do, every, does everybody here know what this does, it's, to be honest? Uh, yeah. Is this clear for everybody so far? Yeah. If it's too slow, you can see it. Huh? We can go faster. It's the question. I don't know. Huh? Um, so that's basically the program here. And then if I compile this here, So um, then I have basically my program, and well, I want to have debug symbols, and then we can do something like uh, test. In this case, so then I have here my program, and then I can set a breakpoint and say, um, so, okay, let's try it out what it does. So it's basically the idea was like that if you do something like this, that you get something out like this. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, if you look at this, do, 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 do you know how you get there? Everybody, okay, yeah? Mm -hmm. And so then you can do uh, GDP, and then you can do, let's say something like, uh, maybe I'm confused and I don't know what's happening here, so let's break at line six and say, okay, I wanna stop at line six. And then you can run this, and if you have arguments, so you have to write your arguments down here, so let's do something like that. And here we are. And basically, you're at the breakpoint, and then uh, what, no, what you do, uh, normally your program is, of course, way, way bigger than this, so uh, you do something like the spec trace, so then it shows you all the, all the, the trace of all the function calls, how that got you there. Yeah? Um, you can do list, you can show where you are in your code, 
and I can do something like, um, so if I don't know what my variables are in there, I do something like A and something like this, yeah? So I just show it this because I always see people coming up then with print, uh, they write print Fs into their code in order to find out how, how things work so that you can do this and uh, basically you, you can you can investigate your code like this, yeah? Um, and that it's not that complicated, so people tell me, yeah, in Python I can do this, and see, I can't do this because I, I need to compile my code, so you can do this just in the same way, yeah? And if in here, for example, I want to change a variable, I can do something like this, yeah? And if I do right now, then B is 5.5, and I change the code it, in, in my program in order to test out whatever thing, yeah? Um, so you can all, all do this, yeah? Um, so this is this is basically just just the, the most basic thing to, to do here. Yeah? Um, okay, uh, let's continue. Yeah? So uh, another thing is basically it is uh, memory addresses and and, and and sanitizers. So so I will just stay here. Um, so basically what you have here is basically where well, we have, uh, basically you, as I told you, uh, this here basically gives you back um, uh, the memory uh, for, for 10 integers in this case here. And then basically if you do this, as this basically starts at zero, uh, so you're basically out of bounds here. So you write to the 11th that you didn't have reserved. Uh, and this probably, well, will not give you an error because it will probably be still in the address space that the operating system has reserved for your whole program. Um, it will not give you an error if you have an operating system which doesn't do memory management. So the old operating systems or weird hardware which doesn't do memory management at all. So if you're on Windows 98 and you do something like this, you basically you can write into the memory of another program and destroy the other program. Um, uh, so uh, basically, that's the that's the way it works here. And uh, basically, when you have uh, then once you can you can for example push this back and say okay I don't need this this memory anymore, and then you still access it. Uh, so then then you also get an error. And all these errors basically you can capture it today. So um, you you can compile your program like this. And. Uh, uh, Apple and Google, they once wrote uh, an address sanitizer when they wrote their client compiler and it was ported to GCC and basically what this does, it, it basically tells you when you run your program, okay, well, you have an out of bounds ex uh, access and uh, you should do something about it. Yeah? Um, can we do this here? <laughs> so uh, just to show you how this works, uh, let's do this here. Yeah. Does the error happen at compilation? That's probably time. Usually, it's like segmentation for the error. No. Yeah. No. But basically, so um, the stuff is basically what this does. Um, so this basically it replaces all your your malloc calls when you compile it like this. This is a debug build. Huh? You don't build this for uh, for, for run time. Yeah. Uh, it basically replaces all your malloc calls and puts some instrumentation in there. And if you run it, basically here you don't get a, a segmentation first, but you get out of bounds and the map of your memory. And but but I will show it to you, yeah, so that that you see what this is, looks like. Because many people don't know this, and they say it's also complicated. And if you know these these little tricks, then you find out it's not that complicated actually. Yeah. Um, so uh, let's do this. Yeah. Um, let's do something like this. So let's uh, do something like. Um, what can we do here? So let's say we have your float, uh, and this is a float A. Um, and uh, what are we going to do here? Let's see. If, uh, Okay, uh, and let's say we store into A here. <laughs> so let, let's make a C error. So let's do something like this. Uh, and we do here. Okay. 
Okay, and we copy paste this and we put this down here. So everybody gets the error here. Yeah, because two is out of bounds because you reserve two locations and it start you start at zero. So basically, you're then you're out of bounds with two. Yeah. Um, so let's compile this that way. I'm sorry, I compile it in here because it's just more convenient in this case here. And we do it so we can write this down in the terminal and it gives you the same result. But let's do it like this here. And if I run right now, you get something like this. Okay, and it basically tells you, okay, uh, you reserved the memory here in these lines, you're writing next to, to the reserved memory and you're out of bounds. Yeah? Okay? So that's, that's how you debug your memory errors. Yeah? So uh, then basically, why, why are we all doing this? So um, basically we want to do performance and uh, uh, well, the story is like maybe uh, throw your software engineering book out of the window yeah? because probably everything that you're learning there is basically hindering you to get performance in many ways yeah? um, and become a practical programmer. So basically let's just try to write codes and get your code out there and try to do it in, in practical manners. Yeah? Um, and, and, and learn to know your machine. Yeah? So basically work with the machine. And, I mean, it's really nice to do object-oriented programming and all this stuff, but uh, at a certain point, uh, you, you, sometimes even for humans, the, the code is more writable if you write it more direct and if you if you know what you're doing. Yeah, um, and so so wh why to do this? Yeah? So let's let's talk a bit about how how, how your machine actually works. Yeah. Um, so you have a, a pipeline processor. Yeah. Um, so basically, the instruction somewhere goes in here, but when you run your code and basically then it goes over here and then other instructions is basically loaded into the processor and so you have several what they call in-flight instructions yeah and so basically this doesn't really slow down if you write it correctly your processor because you finish one instruction every cycle yeah the problem is that basically you have to predict all the instructions that are down here according to the result that the last instruction might yield. Yeah? And so basically you have to know the flow of your program. Yeah? And if basically your last instruction here gives a result which was not predicted because here you have an if and basically you go down the wrong code path, that the whole pipeline here falls down and you're basically you're losing maybe 20, 20 processor cycles, yeah? Um, so uh, basically it takes uh, m multiple instructions to finish this. And basically what this tells you is, uh, w what should you do basically in order to, to avoid these pipeline stalls, yeah? So that your code runs faster. It's basically you should avoid branches, yeah? So you should, if, if you don't need to use an if, or if you don't need to use a switch, don't do it, yeah? Because that way, basically, the program can uh, fill up these instructions down here, and it will be sure that basically it's, it's assured that the next instruction will be according to what you have in your program, and you don't jump around in your code. Yeah. Um, avoid function calls. Yeah. Uh, it's terrible. I mean, of course, all these things are uh, take it with a salt, with a grain of salt. Yeah. But uh, that's the way it is. Yeah. It's like the more function calls you do, the more you jump around in your code the less predictable your code basically gets yeah, for, for the processor uh, and the, the slower your code will run. Yeah? Yeah? It's not supposed to be the O2 uh, optimization that's... You can... reduce a lot of this. Yeah, so basically your compiler can inline functions. Yeah? And you can basically tell uh, even when you write the code inline this function. Yeah? Uh, you, you can do this, yeah, but not, uh, let's say, if you do O2, yeah, and you didn't tell the compiler to inline this function, it, 
it might do it. Yeah. So it's really the, the compiler is actually very conservative. Yeah. So it's not if you know you do it and write it there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because basically the compiler here is to assure that the result is the result that you expect. Yeah? And for example, if you inline a function, yeah, it might happen that yeah, you do a floating point calculation a little bit different, yeah, and instead of A plus B, you write B plus A, yeah. And then the compiler won't do it because you will say, okay, this gives a different result. And for you, A plus B is if, if it changes in the at the last comma or not, it doesn't matter. Yeah. So so that's why basically it's better you do it than the compiler you let it to the compiler. Yeah. Um, so avoid unpredictable jumps. So basically, what we this basically comes boils down to to this. Yeah. And then uh, basically, if you look at these, yeah, so this is kind of the antithesis to to object oriented programming. Yeah. Uh, which is terrible to say it, but I mean, of course, if you do object oriented programming, you do function calls all the time. Yeah. Because that's the way all your stuff is built. Yeah. Because you have your objects with your methods, and you call them, and you do construct and deconstruct and, uh, uh, and allocate memory and deallocate memory all the time. Uh, and, and basically, this is this is then why, why C is faster than C++, of course. Yeah. Um, so so you you basically you have to find the trade-off yeah, on on how much you want to abstract your stuff and how much you want to get your machine to to finish the stuff. Yeah. And of course, the problem is that all this is never taught in, at the university, because at the university, you learn Python, because Python controls all the constructs that probably, uh, as a software engineer, you can imagine, yeah? from object-oriented stuff to lambda functions and whatever. But they never tell you that all this stuff basically is very nice, but, uh, and very nice theoretically, but it runs slow on your machine. Yeah? So, so another stuff that basically can bring you a lot, lot of of um, uh, of, of uh, speed is basically memory hierarchy. Yeah. Um, so if you if you keep this in mind, so basically you have memory which is far away from the processor and memory which is very close to the processor. So basically you have your disk here. From the disk you you charge basically the the, the data into your memory from there goes to the cache and then it goes to the registers yeah and between all of these your uh, orders of magnitude uh, you lose yeah basically if you go here it's like i don't know uh, 10000 times slower to read from here than to read from here yeah at least yeah um, and so the stuff is basically that when you read from here uh, to get to here Basically, you don't read like one byte. Yeah? So if you like, you you type in one number and you read one number from uh, variable from that file. Yeah. So basically, what the stuff does, basically, it always at least reads uh, at least from the disk. Yeah, in pages which are at least 512 k's to the in size. Yeah. So it reads from your byte plus the 512 next to it. Yeah. And basically, if you keep this in mind, uh, then uh, what, what this tells you is you shouldn't do um, unpredictable memory excesses. Yeah? So it's way better to do something like um, so, like this, where basically you have AI and basically, well, the next address is just next to it because then you don't have to charge it because you, anyway you have already charged 512 case. Yeah. So you already have a two if a, uh, if you loaded a one, you already have a two in memory. Yeah. Yeah, so the idea basically what this tells you is if you read memory, always read memory in, 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 in consistent blocks. Yeah? And don't do something like this, yeah, where basically here you have some complicated function yeah? um, and, and read randomly from, from data in memory. Yeah? Because this slows your stuff down and you basically stores your program. Yeah? Um, so, so that's basically what comes in here. Um, so, so another story what basically comes in here is uh, loop unrolling. So the compiler does this up to a certain point. Uh, but sometimes it's even nicer for the compiler to um, to use all the registers that you have. So I don't know, a modern register, I guess, is a 20 so floating point register, something like this, yeah, at least. And basically, when you 
so basically what this does here is if you write your code like this, yeah, what it will do, basically it will reserve a register for each of these variables. Yeah? So besides that if you just use one line here yeah, uh, and don't divide this here by four, yeah, then basically it will just use one register and it might be slower. Yeah? Um, I mean, modern compilers do this. Yeah, this is really the, the, the advanced level of optimization. Yeah, um, but uh, there are many people who still do this by hand, especially when you do vectorization. But we will talk about this afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Um, then, of course, if you do all these things, I mean, uh, you, you you need to profile your code. Yeah. So the story is like, um, basically, once you write your code, uh, you probably don't have all this in mind, and then you will find out, well, uh, where basically, where should I use all these tricks, yeah? And for, for this, basically, you need a profiler, and you need to find out, well, where, where am I using, where am I losing my, all the processing time that I have, yeah? Um, and uh, in Linux, so basically, you have like, um, so I have shown you here three, so basically there's uh, a profiler which is shipped with the kernel, so basically which you should have on any any Linux distribution somewhere. Um, they're shipped with the kernel source, yeah, but uh, the, probably a package in the distribution exists, so which is called perf. Yeah. Then you have another one which is called oprofile, which is a bit nicer than perf, so perf is very crude from the output, to be honest. Yeah. Um, o, o profile is a bit nicer, and then even nicer is uh, what, what is called Google Performance Tools. Um, the, ni the nice thing about uh, Google Performance Tools is also it doesn't need like um, uh, special access, let's call it, to the kernel. So if you do perf or if you do O profile on most of the distributions, you actually need uh, need root rights in order to do it because you have the instrumentation in the kernel, and in order to to query this instrumentation, um, you, you basically you need root access to to your machine. Um, with Google Performance Tools, you basically you have a library. You link your binary to the library, and uh, then you have all the instrumentation in your binary, basically. Yeah. Um, the stuff is that this, of course, has a bigger performance impact on, on your code um, than doing this. And you want, of course, the profiling code not to have a lot of performance impact because the problem is if you if you run your binary and maybe the, the profiling that you do, of course, you do it on a huge data set because otherwise you don't know basically which takes up a lot of time. And if then the profiling basically slows your binary down by an order of 10, uh, then you might never finish your program. Yeah? So this is this is basically the story. So you have to make a trade-off. Well, do you want to have the crude stuff, which has which comes with the Linux kernel and which is fast, or do you want to have the nice stuff, um, which basically which makes nice things, but which which slows down your binary. Yeah? Um, so what does this looks like? So uh, basically, if you use perf. Um, you basically can, can can use something like this. So basically, this f is basically the frequency. So here, with with uh, thousand hertz, you basically you instrument your code and you look where where, where am I spending a, a time right now? Where am I right now in the code? And basically, as you instrument it, uh, basically then uh, it uh, you, you basically find the hot loops because you you then you fall into the loops where you spend most of the time. Yeah? So this is basically the way this works. Yeah? Um, and then basically, if you have an input processor, you can do this, and then you can do hardware instru instrumentation. So then it's basically faster. Yeah. Uh, so if you have a, a processor which which is broader or better, you can you can add this. Otherwise, you don't add this, and it still works yeah, because it worked before that. But uh, as we all probably have here input processors uh, besides some 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 apples or whatever, um, that, that's that's the way it works. Yeah. And then you can uh, basically generate from, from this instrumentation file that you have a report, and you can annotate this report, and then you see in your code basically what it looks like. Yeah? So I will show you this then, then afterwards. Um, so uh, that's basically, it. if then you do it with O profile, it basically is the same. So you do O of your program, you generate a report, and you can annotate basically this stuff. Um, where you can basically have the source and the assembly code of, of your program and basically get get, get, this, uh, get this as a text file out where each line is annotated, how much time you spend at this line. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and then basically Google, the Google stuff basically 
uh, also it works a bit more complicated because you basically have to compile your your program with this L profile switch, which basically links it to this to this library uh, in order to do the profiling, and then you can run a program with with this environment flags here, so which tells you how, how often you want to instrument your uh, your program. Um, where to write uh, basically the profile that you generate from this instrumentation, and then it allows you to it creates your nice a nice uh, stuff like this with where the boxes are bigger where you spend most of the time in your code. Yeah? Um, so 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 that's the way it looks like. So basically, uh, well, let's show you what, how this works in practice. Yeah. Um, so prepared some stuff which is a bit bigger than this. Yeah? Um, so basically here I have a little stuff that I write here for my everyday everyday uh, work here, uh, uh, which resolves uh, some some network. Yeah? Um, and basically we compile this here with this uh, maybe with this Google profiling code. So or um, well, what will we do? So should I compile it like this? We can be yeah. Let's show you just maybe the perf stuff. Yeah. Um, so the perf stuff, uh, we just compile this. And we just make sure here that we have these uh, debug symbols in there. So if you use this G, basically it, it uh, you have your code inside your binary, so then you can annotate. So basically you need this in order so that these programs basically know um, where. Um, where you spend your time, yeah? because otherwise you just have the assembly code and they don't, they can't really annotate it in C, basically. Yeah? Um, so then we compile this here, um, and then uh, basically we can do something like uh, perf, and here I need to do sudo, yeah? um, because otherwise this doesn't work. And you can say, uh, well, uh, record, um, I skip the F because then I guess it uses the most most uh, possible here. And you do uh, this Intel PT stuff here. Um, and then we run our program. So um, my program is here. So basically this calculates the gradient around the edges of a network whatever, not, not that important. Uh, the question is just to show you how this how this stuff here works. Uh. Um, and then I need some arguments to this program. So basically I have here, um, let's do that it takes some time. Um, I need a password because this is pseudo stuff. And then it has run here this program, and this here is basically the output of my program. So these are the weights along the edges of my network whatsoever. Yeah? Um, what is interesting, so you have basically this perf record. So basically you have a file in your home directory that it creates in order to instrument the stuff. And then you can basically do um, perf annotate. <coughs> no? Am I doing some things wrong here? No, Annotate a really wrong. And then we instrument it too much because we have here, what is it? One gigabyte of performance data, that's where it is. Maybe we should have instrumented less there. Yeah? Um, no, let's instrument a bit less. I will still have 500 megabytes of performance data. Okay, so uh, and it, yeah, when we believe we let this run, and then we will see where we get there. Um, so basically, that's the way you you do it. I mean, nice is this Google stuff because it creates you this this files here. You have all these commands, how this works in in here how you can profile your code and how to find basically hot loops. Yeah, and so basically here it says. Basically, in this Google profile here, uh, basically tells you that um, at line 408 in my code, I spend 36% of all, all the compute time. Yeah? So if I want to optimize my code, well, probably I, I look at this line and I look what can I do at this line in order to, to get it faster. Yeah? Um, 
so so that's the way it is. So once you have done this this performance stuff, um, well, then you want to 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 optimize it. Yeah. I'm curious what my my computer does. Why it takes here so long? Just to make sure. No, it's running. So okay. Uh, just to make sure we're not running out of memory because of this profiling stuff. Um, so um, basically, after once you have profiled your code and you have found out uh, as we did here, basically uh, as we are going to be maybe um, that uh, that you have a, a hot point basically in your in your code. Well, what you can do is uh, you can use this. For example, one thing that you can do in C is you can use this the synth instructions. So. Um, so, so what is this basically? So uh, modern processors basically they do computation like this. Yeah? Um, so basically all this is one instruction. This is one register uh, which has the size uh, that you can fill uh, four floating point numbers in there, four double precision floating point numbers. And basically it calculates all these four in, in one, one single cycle. Yeah? So, uh, if you have a computer which is like, I don't know, uh, 3,000 megahertz, so uh, 3,000 times per, per, per second, you basically, you can do this, yeah? Um, the stuff is like, if you write your code, or, and you write it just like normal C code, what the compiler does is, because he doesn't know how to fill up all this stuff, so basically he uses the same register, but he puts in here a float, here a float, here a float, here a float, and he just masks all the rest, yeah? and does a single floating point computation. Yeah? And you basically, you lose all the performance. Yeah? And that's what's done in 90% of the cases. Yeah? So, um, so uh, basically, uh, almost all modern computers have this, so even your phones have these SIMT units basically today, so um, this basically exists everywhere. Uh, but it's hardly used. I mean, it's hardly used and not hardly used because if you watch a video somewhere, basically, of course, all the all the algorithms are then optimized for this kind of stuff. Um, but uh, people which were write every day to take programs, basically, they hardly use this. Yeah? Um, so uh, the stuff is like uh, again, uh, your compiler can do some of this stuff, but basically, you can only do the most simple cases. Yeah? Again, because the compiler has to assure that the result has to be the same, yeah? And basically, for example, let's say you calculate the dot product, yeah, and you you use this function in order to, to sum up these two vectors, yeah? As here, you do four computations at a time, and basically it changes the structure of how you evaluate your floating point numbers. You, you get a different result than if you just do it one by one, yeah? Okay? And that's why the compiler, basically, he won't do it, yeah? So you basically have to know that if you want to do this, you have to instruct the compiler, okay, I want here to do this. Yeah? Um, and the way to do this today is basically, so either you go down to assembly and you use the assembly instructions in order to do this, because your compiler, he, he won't do it. Yeah? So the big theory when people invented this was that one day we will have compilers which will do this all automatically, but uh, they tell this to us for 20 years right now, and uh, 20 years later, I can tell you that we still don't have compilers that they basically do this all automatically, yeah? Um, so basically, you have this FG vectorized that you can put to a GCC and then basically tries if you have a loop like um, like this, this simple for loop that we had some up there, up here, you no, know, I don't know, like uh, this here, yeah? So basically, it will it will find for for this year it will work. Yeah? So basically, he, here it will understand. Okay, um, these are if this is an integer and this also is an integer, then it basically will do this with simple, simple instructions. Yeah. Um, but if you have something more complicated than this, probably it will break. Yeah. Um, to to be honest, so it really works for the most simple cases. Yeah. Um, if you do auto vectorization. Yeah. Um, so otherwise, you have to do it by hand. And how do you do it by hand? So basically what Intel provides you with is basically they provide you with this intrinsic instruction. So if you have a different processor, you, you will find it, yeah? So there is a manual for ARM processors, there's a manual for all kinds of different processors because they, of course, have different instructions. And then you basically you have to, to, to find those instructions. So what does this look like? Um, let's go full screen, then I don't have to, to, to bring up my browser. Um, 
So basically, this is what this looks like. For example, in this instruction manual, so you get go there, and basically you, you select all the instructions that your processor um, basically uh, supports. Yeah? And then you basically you get uh, these, these little, little C functions with, with very weird types, yeah? um, which basically uh, call inline an assembly function. Yeah? So they directly, when the compiler is, uh, is brought up, they directly translate this into assembly. Yeah? And you, they're really nice because they tell you, for example, if you call, if you call this in your C code, Basically, you have a latency of four, so it takes like um, four instructions in order to, to, to call this function. Yeah? But you have a throughput of 0.5, so basically it means you can finish two of these instructions per cycle. Yeah? So this is like, in order to, the story is basically that when we have this pipeline here, where was it? When we have this pipeline, so in order to get here, it takes you four cycles for full cycles, but once you're here, you basically, you can finish two, two at the same time. Yeah? Uh, that, that's kind of the story of what, what this tells you here. Yeah? Um, and so you can choose the instructions, which are basically by, by their, uh, in here, by, by their speed that basically that you want to have. Yeah? Um, and basically, so this is the, the, the function that I've chosen here, it does just what we have shown here before. So it basically takes, um, it takes three, three vectors, which are four in size, uh, and uh, basically adds and multiplies them together in, 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 one, in one step. Yeah? So, so that's the, the way it works. Yeah? Um, uh, so uh, how does this look? Yeah? Ah, OK. So, uh, yeah, I don't know, either we do another session or we do questions or uh, as you like, yeah? Because I still have enough stuff here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, like, yeah, so we, maybe we can wrap up this here. So basically we have like, uh, maybe we stop here and we maybe do another session if you're interested in that, yeah? Um, because here we have like the, the instrumentation profile basically came up here. So basically here you see what this looks like. Um, so here you have your source code lines and here you have basically the assembly code. So how this source code here translates into machine instructions. And basically here you have like the percentage, how much time you spend on this line. Yeah. And then you can scroll through this and then you find lines which are hot or not hot or if you're nice, you write yourself a script so that you basically get the, the lines on the start, which are basically, which are, which are hot here. Yeah? Um, and basically that's what it looks like. Yeah? So basically you see here at line 405, you already spend yeah, less than 1% of the time, but you spend some time in order to do this here. Yeah? Um, so what are you spending the time here? Well, to increment this and to, to verify this. No? So that's basically what it says here. No? Um, and uh, that's basically the way it is. So here, here where you get into this green area, it becomes more interesting. Yeah? So basically, visibly this code here, uh, basically spend, it takes some more time. Yeah? So here you already spend like 4% of, of your code in, in, in this line here. And that's the way it is. So there you screw through this, you find some hot lines, and then you basically optimize it with the tricks that, that we show you in the next session or something like this. Yeah? Okay.